OK, so let's uh, get started with the actual t uh, technical content. So remember from last time, we gave an overview of the class. We talked about different types of models that we we're going to explore, reflex models, state-based models, variable-based models, and logic models, which we'll see throughout the course. But underlying all of this is you know, machine learning. Because machine learning is uh, what allows you to take data and um, tune the parameters of the model so you don't have to uh, work as hard designing the model. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to start with the simplest of the models, of reflex-based models, um, and show how machine learning can be applied to these type of models. And throughout the class, uh, we're going to talk about different types of models and how learning will help with those as well. So there's going to be three parts. We're going to talk about linear predictors, um, which includes classification and regression, um, loss minimization, which is basically setting up objective function of how you uh, want to train your machine learning model, and then stochastic gradient descent, which is an algorithm that allows you to actually uh, do the work. So let's start with uh, perhaps the most um, cliched example of uh, you know, machine learning. So you have, we want to do spam classification. So the input is X, um, an email message. Um, and you want to know whether an email message is uh, spam or not spam. Um, so we're going to denote the output of the classifier to be Y, which is, in this case, either spam or not spam. And our goal is to uh, produce a predictor, F. right? So a predictor, in general, is going to be a, a function that maps some input X to some output Y. In this case, it's going to take an email message and map it to whether the email message is spam or not. OK, so th there's many types of prediction problems. Um, binary classification is the simplest one, where the output is one of two um, possibilities, either yes or no. And we're going to usually denote this as plus 1 or minus 1. Sometimes you also see 1 and 0. Um, there's regression, where you're trying to predict a numerical value, for example, let's say housing price. Um, there's a multi-class classification where y is um, not just two items, but possibly um, 100 items, maybe cat, dog, truck, tree, and different kind of image categories. Um, there's a ranking where the output um, is a permutation of input. This could be useful, for example, if the input is a set of um, articles or products or web pages, and you want to rank them in some order to show to a user. Um, structure prediction is where y uh, the output is an object that is much more complicated. Um, perhaps it's a whole sentence or even an image. And it's something that you have to kind of construct. You have to build this thing from scratch. It's not just a labeling. Um, and there's many more types of prediction problems. Um, but underlying all of this, you know, whenever someone says, I'm going to do machine learning, the first question you ask is, OK, what's the data? Because without data, there's no learning. So we're going to call an example. Um, x, y pair is something that specifies what the output should be when the input is x. Okay? And a training data or a set of examples, the training set, is going to be simply a list or a multi-set of uh, examples. So you can think about this as a partial specification of behavior. So remember, we're trying to design a system that has certain, certain types of behaviors. And I'm going to show you examples of what that system should do. If I have some email message that has CS221, then it's not spam. But if it has um, lots of uh, dollar signs, then it might um, um, be spam. Um, and uh, so remember, this is not a full specification of behavior. These uh, 10 examples, or even a million examples, might not tell you what exactly this function is supposed to do. It's just examples of uh, what the function could do on those particular examples. OK, so once you have this data, so we're going to use dtrain to denote uh, the data set. Remember, it's a set of input-output pairs. Um, we're going to uh, push this into a learning algorithm, or a learner. And what is the learning algorithm going to produce? It's going to produce a predictor. So the predictors are f. And the predictor, remember, is what? It's actually itself a function that um, takes an input x and maps it to an output y. Okay? So there's kind of two levels here. And you can understand this in terms of the uh, modeling inference uh, learning paradigm. So modeling is about the question of what should the types of uh, predictors f you should consider are. Uh, inference is about how do you compute y given x. And learning is about how you take data and produce a predictor so that you can do inference. 
Okay. Any questions about this so far? So this is pretty high level and abstract and generic right now. And this is kind of kind of on purpose because I want to highlight how um, general machine learning is before going into the specifics of uh, linear predictors. Right? So this is an abstract framework. OK, so let's dig in a little bit to this actual, um, an actual problem. Um, so just to simplify uh, the email problem, let's uh, consider the task of um, predicting whether a string is an email address or not. Okay? Um, so the input is, an email, uh, is a string. And uh, the output is it's a binary classification problem. It's either 1 if it's an email or minus 1 if it's not. That's what you want. Um, um, so the first step of um, doing linear prediction is um, known as feature extraction. And the question you should ask yourself is, what properties of the input x might be relevant for predicting the output y? Right? So I say it really highlight might be. Right? At this point, you're not trying to encode the actual set of rules that solves the problem. That would you know, involve no learning. That would just be trying to do it directly. But instead, uh, for learning, you're kind of taking a, um, you know, more of a backseat, and you're saying, well, here are some hints that could help you. Okay? Uh, so formally, a feature extractor takes an input and outputs a set of feature name, feature value pairs. Right? So I'll go through an example here. So if I have abc.gmail.com, what are the properties that might be useful for determining whether a string is an email address or not? Well, you might consider the length of the string. If it's you know, greater than 10, maybe long strings are less likely to be email addresses than shorter ones. Um, and here, the feature name is length greater than 10. So that's just kind of the label of that feature. And the value of that feature is 1, uh, representing it's true. So it would be 0 if it's false. Here's another feature, the fraction of alphanumeric characters. right? So that happens to be 0.85, which is the number. Um, there might be features that test for particular um, you know, letters. For example, that it doesn't contain an at sign. Well, that has a you know, feature value of 1 because there is an at sign. Ends with .com is 1. Ends with .org is uh, 0 because that's not true. So, um, and there, you could have many, many more features. Um, and we'll talk more about features on next time. But the point is that you have a set of properties. You're kind of distilling down this input, which is could be a string, it could be an image, or it could be something more complicated, into kind of a um, you know, ground-up fashion that later we'll see how a machine learning algorithm can take advantage of. OK, so you have this uh, feature vector, which has, is a list of feature values and their associated names or labels. Okay? But later we'll see that the, the names don't matter to the learning algorithm. So actually what you should also think about the feature vector is simply a list of numbers. And just kind of on the side make a note that, oh, this you know, position number 3 corresponds to contains at and so on. Right? So I've distilled the, the email address abc at gmail.com into the list of numbers 0 uh, or 1, 0 0.85, 1, 1, 0. OK, so that's the feature extraction. It's kind of distilling complex objects into lists of numbers, which we'll see is what the, the kind of the lingua franca of these machine learning algorithms is. OK, so I'm going to write some concepts on the board. There's going to be a bunch of um, concepts I'm going to introduce, and I'll just keep them up on the board for reference. So feature vector is a kind of important notion. And it's denoted phi um, of x an input. So phi itself, sometimes you think about it, uh, you call it the feature map, which takes an input and returns um, a vector. And this notation means that it returns, in general, a d-dimensional vector, so a list of d numbers. And um, the components of this feature vector we can write down as phi1, phi2, all the way to phi d of, of x. OK, so this notation is uh, you know, convenient um, because we're going to start shifting our focus from thinking about the features as properties of input to features as kind of mathematical objects. So in particular, phi of x is a point in a high dimensional space. So if you had two features, that would be a point in two dimensional space. But in general, you might have a million features. So that's a feature 
uh, it's a point in a, a, hundred, a, a million dimensional space. So you know, it might be hard to think about that space, but we'll, we'll see how we can you know, deal with that in a, later in a, in a bit. OK, so, so that's a feature vector. You take an input and return a list of numbers. Okay. Um, and now the second piece is a weight vector. So let me write down weight vector. So a weight vector is going to be noted w. Um, and this is also a, a list of d numbers. It's a you know, point in a d-dimensional space. But it, we're going to interpret it differently, as we'll see later. Okay, so the so way to think about a weight vector is that for each feature j, so for example, frac of alpha, um, we're going to have a real number, wj, that represents the contribution of that feature to the prediction. So this contribution is 0.6. Okay. So what does this 0.6 mean? So, so the way to think about this is that you have your weight vector, and you have a feature vector of a particular input, and you want, the score of uh, your prediction is going to be uh, the dot product between the weight vector and the feature vector. Okay, so um, that's written uh, w dot a phi of x, um, which is um, written out as basically looking at all the features and multiplying the feature value times the weight of that feature and summing up all those numbers. So for this example, um, it would be minus 1.2, that's the weight of the first feature, times 1, that's the feature value, uh, plus 0.6 uh, times 0.85, and so on, until you get this number 4.51, which is, happens to be the score for this example. Question? So the feature extraction with B of x, is that uh, supposed to be like an automated process, or does it require like manual extraction of specification of each? Yeah, so the question is, is the feature extraction manual or automatic? So uh, f f phi is going to be implemented as uh, a function, like in, in code, right? Um, you're going to write this function manually, but you know, the, the function itself is run automatically on examples. Um, later, we'll see how you can actually learn features as well. So you can slowly start to do less of the manual effort, but uh, we're going to hold off until next time for that. Question. So we were talking about weight meaning, and I know that in certain types of regressions, like uh, the weights mean uh, a percentage change if this variable leads to a percentage change in the outcome. It doesn't. It doesn't mean this here. Right? Yeah. So the question is about interpretation of weights. Sometimes weights can have a more precise meaning. In general, um, you can you, you can try to read the tea leaves, but it. I, I don't think there is maybe a, in general mathematically. Uh, precise thing you can say about the meaning of individual weights. But intuitively, and, and the intuition is important, is that you should think about each feature as you know, a little person that's going to make a vote on this prediction. right? So you're voting either plus, yay, or nay. And uh, the weight of a particular feature is specifies both the direction of the vote, whether if positive weight means that um, that little person is um, voting positive, and uh, negative weight means that it's voting negative. And the magnitude of that weight is how strongly that little person feels about uh, the prediction. Right, so um, you know, contains at is 3, because maybe like at signs generally do occur in email addresses. But you know, the fraction of alphanumeric characters, it's you know, less. So at that level, you can have some intuition. But the precise numbers and why is 0.6 versus 0.5, um, that's, um, you can't really say much about that. Yeah, another question. Uh, does a dot product, <coughs> is this the same dot product for deeper networks? Like if we have like four weight vectors afterwards, is it still like, like just more <coughs> products? Uh, so right now we're focusing on linear classifiers. So the question is, what happens if you have a neural net with more layers? Um, there's going to be more dot products, but there's also going, it's not just adding more features. There's going to be other uh, components, which we'll get to in a later lecture. Yeah. So do all the weights have to add up to a certain number, or like how do you normalize it so the weights like are, don't change the score value by like some specific? Yeah. So the question is, do the weights have to add up to something? The short answer is uh, no. Um, there's obviously restricted settings where you might want to normalize the the weights or something, but we're not going to you know uh, consider that right now. Um, later we'll see that the magnitude of the weight does uh, tell you you know something. 
OK, so, so just to summarize, it, it's important to note that the, the wave vector, there's only one wave vector, right? You have to find one set of parameters for every, everybody. Um, but the feature vector is per example. So for every input, you get a new feature vector. So, and the dot product of those two weighted combination of features is the uh, score. OK, so, so now let's try to put the pieces together and define um, uh, of the actual predictor. Right? So remember, we had this uh, box with an f in it, which takes x and returns y. So what is inside that box? Um, and I've hopefully given you some intuition. Let me go to a board and write a few more things. So the score, uh, remember, is w dot v of x. And this is just going to be a number. Um, and uh, the predictor, so linear pre uh, predictor, well, actually, let me call this uh, linear, to be more precise, it's a linear classifier, not just a predictor. Classifier is just a predictor that does classification. Um, so a linear classifier um, denoted f of w. So f is what we're going to use to denote predictors. W just means that this predictor depends on a particular set of weights. And this predictor is uh, going to look at the score and return the sign of that score. So what is a sign? The sign looks at the score and says, is it a positive number? If it's positive, then I'm going to return plus 1. If it's a negative number, I'm going to return minus 1. And if it's 0, then you know, I don't care. You can return plus 1 if you want. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, so what this is doing, remember the, sc the score is either is a real number. So it's either going to be like kind of leaning towards um, you know, large value, large positive values, or leaning towards uh, large uh, small negative values. And the sign basically says, OK, you've got to commit. Are you, which side are you on? Are you on the positive side, or are you on the negative side? And just kind of discretizes it. That's what the sign does. OK? OK, so, so let's look at a, a simple example. Because I, I think a lot of what I've said before is kind of more the uh, formal machinery behind and the math behind how it works. But it's really useful to have some uh, geometric intuition, because then you can draw some pictures. OK, so let's consider this uh, case. So we have a, a wave vector, which is 2, one, two minus 1, and a feature vector, which is a 2, 0, and another feature vector, which is 0, 2, and 2, 4. OK, so there's only two dimensions, so I can try to draw them on a board. So let's try to do that. OK, so here is a two-dimensional uh, plot. Um, and let's draw the, fee the wave vector first. OK, so the wave vector is going to be at 2 minus 1. OK, so that's uh, this point. And the way to think about the wave vector is not the point, um, but actually um, the, the, the vector going from the origin to that point. For reasons that will become clear later. Okay, so that's the that's the weight. Okay, um, and then what about the other points? So we have two zero zero two. So two zero is here. Um, zero two is here, and two four is uh, here. Right. Okay. So we have three points here. Okay. So. Um, how do I think about what this weight vector is, is doing? So just for, just for reference, remember um, the classifier is looking at the sine of w dot uh, you know, phi of x. Um, OK. Um, so let's try to do a classification on these three points. OK, so w is, um, let me write it out formally. So 2, 1, um, and this is 0, 2. So what's the score? when I do w dot uh, phi of x here. It's 4, right? Because this is um, uh, 2, 0, 0, 2, um, uh, 2, 4. So this is just a dot product. That's 4. Um, and take the sign. What's the sign of 4? 1. OK, so that means I'm going to label this point as a Positive, right? Positive point. OK, what about 0, 2? Actually, sorry, this is just to be a minus 1, right? OK, this is 2 minus 1. OK, so if I take the dot product between this, I get minus 2. 
and then the sine of minus 2 is is minus 1. OK, so that's a minus. Um, and what about this one? So what's the dot product there? It's going to be 0. OK? So, um, so this classifier will classify this point as a positive, this as a negative, and this one I don't know. OK, so we can fill in more points. Um, but but you know, does anyone see kind of um, maybe a more general pattern? I don't want to have to fill in the entire board with classifications. Yeah? So orthogonal, everything to the right of it is positive. Everything to the left of it is negative. Yeah, so, so let's try to draw the orthogonal. Uh, oh, sh this needs to go through that line. OK. <laughs> OK, so let's draw the orthogonal. So this is a right angle. Okay. And uh, what that gentleman said is that the points, any point over here, um, because it has an acute angle with w, is going to be classified as positive. So all of this stuff is um, you know, positive, 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 positive. And everything over here, because it has an obtuse angle with the w, is going to be negative. So everything over here is negative. And then everything on this uh, line is going to be 0. OK? So, so I don't know. OK, and this line is called um, the decision boundary, which is a concept not just for linear classifiers, but whenever you have any sort of classifier, the decision boundary is the separation between the regions of the space where the classification is positive versus negative. OK? And in this case, um, it's, it separates because uh, it's, we have linear classifiers. The decision boundary is straight. And we're just separating the, the space into you know, two halves. Um, if you were in three dimensions, um, this vector would still be just a, you know, a vector. But this decision um, boundary would be a plane. So you can think about it as you know, coming out of the board if you want. But I'm not going to try to draw that. Um, and that's, that's kind of uh, the geometric interpretation of how linear classifiers uh, you know, work here. Question, yeah? It seems like your wave could be any magnitude. Like, yeah. this is, we have one less degree of freedom in the wave. Yeah. Like the decision boundaries for any mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good point. So the, the observation is that no matter if you scale this weight by 2, it's actually going to still have the same uh, decision boundary. So the magnitude of the weight doesn't matter. It's the direction that matters. Um, so this is true for just m making a prediction. Uh, when we look at learning, uh, the magnitude of the weight will matter because we're going to you know, consider other more nuanced uh, loss functions. Yeah. OK, so let's. Move on. Any questions about linear predictors? So, so far, what we've done is we haven't done any learning, right? Uh, if you've uh, you know, noticed, we've just simply defined the set of predictors that we're interested in. So, we have feature vector, we have wave vectors, multiply them together, get a score, um, and then you can send them through a sine function and you get uh, these linear classifiers, right? There, there's no specification of uh, data yet. So now let's actually turn to do some learning. So remember this framework. Learning needs to take some data and return a predictor. And our predictors are uh, specified by a wave vector. So you can equivalently think about the learning algorithm as outputting uh, a wave vector, if you want, for linear classifiers. Um, and let's unpack the learner. So the learning algorithm is going to be based on optimization, which we started uh, reviewing last lecture, um, which separates uh, what you want to compute from how you want to compute it. So we're going to first define an optimization problem, which is specifies what properties we want a, a classifier to have in terms of the data. And then we're going to figure out how to actually optimize this. And this modularity is actually really, really powerful. Um, and, and it allows people to go ahead and work on different types of uh, criteria for and different types of models. 
separately from the people who actually develop general purpose algorithms. Um, and this has served to kind of the field of machine learning quite well. OK, so let's start with the optimization problem. So there's an important concept um, called a loss function. And this is a super general idea that's used in the machine learning and statistics. So a loss function takes a particular example, x, y, and a weight vector, um, and returns a number. And this number represents how unhappy we would be if we use the predictor given by w to make a prediction on x when the correct output is y. Okay, so it's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, this basically is trying to characterize, you know, if you handed me a classifier and I go onto this example and try to classify it, is it going to get it right or is it going to get it wrong? So high loss is bad, uh, you don't want to lose, and low loss is good. So normally zero loss is the, the best you can kind of hope for. Okay, so let's do, figure out the loss function for binary classification here. Um, so just some notation, the correct label is uh, denoted y, and um, the predicted label, remember, is um, the score uh, sent through the sign function, and that's going to give you some the particular label. Um, and let's uh, look at th this example. So w equals 2 minus 1, phi of x equals uh, 2, 0, and y equals minus 1. Okay? So we already defined the score as um, on example is uh, w dot phi of x, which is um, how co confident we are predicting minus plus 1. That's the way to uh, you know, interpret this. Okay, so um, what's the score of the, for this particular example again? It's four, right? Um, which means that you know we're kind of kind of positive that it's uh, you know a plus one. Yeah, question. Uh, I was just wondering, is the loss function generally one dimensional, or or the output of the loss function? Excuse me. Yeah. So the the question is whether the output of loss function is usually a single number or not. Um, in most cases, it is. For basically all practical cases, you should think about the loss functions up in a single number. The inputs can be, you know, a crazy high dimensional. Yeah? What is it not one dimensional? Um, <coughs> there are cases where you might have multiple objectives that you're trying to optimize at once. Um, but in this class, it's always going to be, you know, one dimensional. Like maybe you care about you know both time and space or accuracy but robustness or something. Sometimes you have multi-objective optimization, but that's like way beyond the scope of this class. Okay, so we have a score, um, and now we're going to define margin. So let me. Um, okay, so let's let's actually do this. So we're talking about classification. I'm going to sneak regression in in a bit. So score is w dot phi of x. This is how confident we are about plus 1. Um, and the margin is the score uh, times y. Um, and this relies on y being plus 1 or minus 1. So this might seem a little bit mysterious, but let's try to you know, decipher that um, here. Um, so. In this example, the score is 4. So what's the margin? You multiply by minus 1, so the margin is uh, minus 4. Right? And the margin's interpretation is how correct we are. Right? So imagine uh, the correct answer is uh, if, if the score and the margin have the same sign, then you're going to get positive numbers. And then the, the, confident, the more confident you are, then, then the more correct you are. Um, but if y is minus 1 and the score is positive, then the margin is going to be negative, which means that uh, you're going to be confidently wrong, um, which is bad. OK, so just to, to see if we kind of understand what's going on. Um, so when does a binary classifier make a mistake on a given example? Um, so I'm going to ask for a kind of a show of hands. How many people think it's, it's when the margin is uh, less than 0? OK, I guess we can kind of stop there. <laughs> um, um, 
I used to do these online quizzes where it wasn't anonymous, but we're not doing that this year. OK, so yes, the margin is less than 0. Um, when the margin is less than 0, that means y and the score are different signs, which means that you're making a mistake. <clears throat> OK, so now we have uh, the notion of a margin. Let's define uh, something called the 0, 1 loss. And it's called 0, 1 because it returns either a 0 or 1. OK, very creative name. Um, so the loss function is uh, simply, did you make a mistake or not? Okay, so this notation, let's try to decipher a bit. So if f of x here is the prediction when the input is x, um, and not equal y is saying, did you make a mistake? So that's, think about it as a Boolean. And this one bracket is um, just notation. It's called an indicator function that takes a condition and returns either 1 or 0. So if, uh, if the, the condition is true, then it's going to return a 1. And if the condition is false, it returns a 0. Okay. So all this is doing is basically returning a 1 if you made a mistake and 0 if you didn't make a mistake. Okay. And we can write that as follows. We can write that as um, the margin less or equal to 0. Right, because on the previous slide, if the margin is less than or equal to zero, then we've made a mistake, and we should incur uh, a loss of one. And if the margin is greater than zero, then we didn't make a mistake, and we should incur a loss of zero. Okay. All right. So um, it will be useful to draw these loss functions um, pictorially like this. Okay. So. On the x-axis here, we're going to show the margin. Right? Remember, the margin is how uh, correct you are. And on the uh, y-axis, we're going to show the, uh, the loss function, which is how much you're going to suffer for it. OK, so remember, the margin. if the margin is positive, that means you're getting it right, which means that the loss is 0. But if the margin is less than 0, that means you're getting it wrong, and the loss is OK, so this is a 0, 1 loss. That's the, 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 thing, the visual that you should have in mind when you think about 0, 1 loss. Yeah? Like less than 0, because we have not defined like when the margin is 0, whether the classifier is correct or incorrect. Yeah, so there's this kind of boundary condition of when ex what happens exactly at 0 that I'm trying to sweep under the rug because it's not um, terribly important. Um, here, it's less or equal to 0 to be kind of on the safe side. So if you don't know, you're also uh, going to get it wrong. Um, otherwise, you could always just return zero, and then you be that. That's you don't want that. Okay. So, is it uh, any questions about uh, kind of binary classification so far? So we've set up these linear predictors, and I've defined the zero and loss as a way to capture um, how unhappy we would be if we had a classifier that was uh, operating on a particular data point, x, y. So um, just to, I'm going to go on a little bit of a digression um, and talk about linear regression. Um, huh. um, and, and the reason I'm doing this is that Loss minimization is such a powerful and general framework, and it, it transcends you know, all of these uh, you know, linear classifiers, regressions, and ups. So I want to kind of emphasize the overall, overall, overall story. So I'm going to give you a bunch of different examples, um, classification re regression side by side, so we can actually see how they compare. And hopefully, the, the common denominator will kind of emerge more um, clearly from that. OK, so we talked a little bit about linear regression in the last lecture. Right? So linear regression, in some sense, is simpler than classification. Because if you have a linear uh, uh, predictor um, and you get the score w dot phi of x, it's already a real number. So in linear regression, you simply return that real number, and you call that your prediction. OK, okay so now we, let's move towards defining a loss function. Um, so there's going to be a, a concept that's going to be useful. It's called the residual, um, which is, as, again, kind of trying to capture how uh, wrong you are. Um, so here is a particular 
linear uh, a predictor, um, linear regressor, um, and it's making predictions all along you know, for different values of x. Um, and here's a data point of phi of x, y. Okay? So the residual is the difference between um, the true value y and the predicted value y. Okay? Um, and in particular, it's the amount by which um, the prediction is overshooting you know, the target. Okay, so this is this is a difference, um, and if you square the difference, you get something called uh, the squared loss. So this is something we mentioned last lecture. Um, residual can be either negative or positive, um, but errors either if you're very positive or very negative, that's bad. And squaring it makes it so that you're gonna you know suffer equally for. Um, errors in both you know, directions. Okay, so the square loss is the residual squared. So let's do this kind of simple example. So here we have our wave vector 2 minus 1. The feature vector is 2, 0. What's the score? It's 4. y is minus 1. So uh, the residual is 4 minus minus 1, which is 5. And uh, 5 squared is 25. So the square loss on this particular example is 25. OK, so let's plot this. So just like we did it for a 0 on loss, so let's see what this loss function looks like. So the, the horizontal axis here, instead of being the margin, is going to be this quantity uh, for regression called the residual. Um, it's going to be the difference between the prediction and the, the true target. And I'm going to plot the loss function. Um, and this locked function is just you know, the squared function, right? So with, if the residual is 0, then the loss is 0. If, as the residual grows in either direction, then I'm going to pay uh, something for it. And it's a quadratic penalty, which means that um, it actually grows you know, uh, pretty fast. So if I'm, you know, the residual is 10, then I'm paying 100. OK, so, so that's the squared loss. Um, there's also another loss I'll throw in here um, called the absolute deviation loss. And this might actually be the loss that, if you didn't know about regression, you might uh, immediately come to. It's basically the absolute difference between the prediction and um, the, the actual true target. Um, turns out the squared loss, uh, th there's a kind of a longer discussion about you know, which loss function um, you know, makes sense. The, the salient points here are that the absolute deviation loss is kind of has this uh, kink here. Um, and so it's not smooth. Sometimes it makes it harder to optimize. Um, but the square loss also has this kind of thing that blows up, which means that it's, um, uh, it really doesn't like having outliers or uh, really large values, because it's gonna, you're, you're going to pay a lot for it. Um, but at this level, just think about this as you know, different losses. There's also something called the Huber loss, which uh, kind of uh, um, combines both of these, is smooth, and also grows linearly instead of quadratically. Um, OK, so we have uh, both classification you know, and regression. We can define margins and residuals. We get either uh, different loss functions out of it. right? Um, and now we want to minimize the loss. Okay? Um, so it turns out that for one example, this is really easy, right? So if I if I told you, okay, how do I minimize the loss here? Well, okay, it's zero, done. Um, so that, that's not super interesting. And this corresponds to the fact that you know if you have a classifier and you're just trying to fit one point, um, it's really not that hard. So that's kind of not the point. <laughs> Uh, the point of machine learning is that you have to fit all of them. Remember, you only get one, one wave vector. You have all these examples. You have a million examples. And you want to find one wave vector that kind of balances uh, errors across all of them. And in general, you might not be able to achieve loss of zero. right? So tough luck. Life is hard. Uh, so you have to make trade-offs. You know, which examples are you going to kind of sacrifice for the good of other examples? And this is actually a lot of where you know, issues around fairness of machine learning actually come in, because 
in cases where you can't actually make a prediction that's you know, equally good for everyone, you know, how do you actually in, you know, responsibly make these trade-offs? Um, but you know, that's, a, that's a broader topic. Uh, let's just focus on trade-offs defined by the simple sum over all the loss examples. So let's just say we want to minimize the average loss over all the examples. Okay, so once we have these loss functions, if you average <laughs> over the training set, you get something which we're going to call the train loss. Um, and that's a function of w. Right? So loss is on a particular example. Train loss is on the entire data set. OK. So any questions about this uh, so far? Okay, so there is this uh, discussion about which regression loss to use, which I'm going to skip. Um, you can feel free to read it in the notes if you're interested. The punchline is that if you want things that look like the mean square loss, if you want things that look like the median, use the absolute deviation loss. Um, but I'll skip that for now. Yeah? You will start thinking of regression like this. Uh, when do people start thinking of regression like in terms of loss minimization? Yeah. Uh, so regression has, least squares regression is from like the early 1800s. Um, so it's been around for, is, you know, kind of, you could call it the first machine learning that was ever done, um, if, you, if you want. Um, I guess the loss minimization framework is, um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint a particular point in time. You know, it's, it's kind of not a terribly, uh, um, you know, it's not like a um, you know innovation in some sense. It's just more of a, at least right now, it's kind of a pedagogical tool to organize um, all the different methods that exist. Yeah. Say I'm training on training on mean and mean and median. Do you mean that like the in that particular training training set, the median would be the mm -hmm. most highest accuracy, most confident, whereas like with um, loss absolute deviation will be the median instead of the mean. Yeah, so um, I don't want to get into this example, so, but uh, br briefly, if you have three points that you, you can't exactly f fit perfectly, um, you, if you use absolute deviation, then you're going to find a median value. You're going to basically predict the median value. And if you use the square loss, you're going to predict the mean value. But um, I'm happy to talk <coughs> offline if, if, if you want. OK, so what we've talked about so far is we have these wonderful linear predictors, which are driven by feature vectors and wave vectors. And now we can define a bunch of different loss functions that capture you know, how we care about um, you know, regression and classification. And now let's try to actually do some real uh, machine learning. How, how do you actually optimize these objectives? So remember, the learner is going, uh, so now we've talked about the optimization problem, which is minimizing the training loss. Um, we'll come back to that next lecture. Um, and then now we're going to talk about the optimization algorithm. OK? So what is the optimization problem? Now, remember last time we said, OK, let's just abstract away from the details a little bit. Let's not worry about if it's uh, the square loss or you know, some other loss. Um, Let's just think about it as a kind of an abstract function. So in one dimension, the training loss might look something like this. You have a single weight, and for each weight, you have a number, which is your loss on your training examples. Okay? And you want to find this point. So in two dimensions, um, it looks something like this. And let me try to actually draw this, because I think it will uh, be um, useful in a bit. So let me pull this up. OK, so in two dimensions, um, what optimization looks like is as follows. So I'm going to, I'm now plotting um, w1 and w2, which are the two components of this two-dimensional wave vector. So for every point, I have a wave vector. And that value is going to be the loss, the training loss. Um, and it's, you know, it's pretty standard in these settings to draw what are called level curves. Um, so. Let's do this. So each curve here is a ring of points where uh, the function value is identical. So if you uh, look at terrain maps, those are level curves. So you know kind of what I'm talking about. 
So this is the minimum, and as you kind of grow out, you get larger and larger. Um, OK, I'll keep on doing this for a little bit. OK. All right. Um, and uh, the goal is to find the minimum. OK. All right, so how are we going to do this? So yeah, question. Assuming that there is a single minimum. Yeah, why am I assuming uh, there is a single minimum? In general, for arbitrary loss functions, there's no necessarily a single minimum. I'm just doing this for simplicity. It turns out to be true for um, you know, uh, many of these linear classifiers. <coughs> OK, so last time we talked about gradient descent. right? And the idea behind gradient descent is that, well, I don't know where this is, so let's just start at 0, as good as any place. And what I'm going to do at 0 is I'm going to compute the gradient. So the gradient is this uh, vector that's uh, perpendicular to the level curves. So the gradient is going to point in this direction that says, hey, in this direction is where the function is increasing the most dramatically. Um, and gradient descent says, um, takes the, goes in the opposite direction. right? Because remember, we want to minimize loss. Um, so I'm going to go here. And um, now i am hopefully reduced my uh, function value. Not necessarily, but um, we hope that's, that's the case. Now we compute uh, the gradient again. The gradient says, um, you know, maybe it's pointing this way. So I go in that direction. And maybe now it's uh, pointing this way. And I keep on going. Um, this is a little bit made up. Um, but hopefully, eventually, I get to the, um, the origin. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of simplifying things quite a bit here. So in, there's a whole field of optimization that studies exactly what kind of functions you can optimize and how gradient descent, when it works and when it doesn't. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through the mechanics now and defer the kind of the formal proofs of when this actually works until um, later. OK, so that's kind of the, the schema of how gradient descent works. So in code, this looks like this. So initialize at 0, and then loop on some number of iterations, um, which let's, for simplicity, just think there's a fixed number of iterations. And then I'm going to pick up my weights, compute the gradient, move in the opposite direction, and then there's going to be a step size that uh, tells me how fast I want to you know, make progress. Okay, And we'll come back to you know, uh, what uh, the step size uh, does later. OK, so let's specialize this to a uh, least squares uh, regression. So we kind of did this uh, last week, but um, just to kind of review. Um, so the training loss for least squares uh, regression is this. So remember, it's an average over the loss of individual examples. And the loss of a particular example is the residual squared. So that's this expression. Um, and then all we have to do is compute the gradient. And you know, if you remember your calculus, it's just uh, use a chain rule. Um, so this 2 comes down here. You have the, um, you know, the residual times the derivative of what's inside here. And the gradient with respect to w is uh, phi of x. Okay. So last time we did this in Python in one dimension. So in one dimension, hopefully all of you should feel comfortable doing this because this is just kind of basic um, calculus. Um, here we have w is a vector. So um, we're not taking derivatives, but we're taking <laughs> gradients. Um, so there's you know, some things to be uh, wary of. But um, in this case, it's often kind of useful to double check that, well, um, the gradient version actually matches uh, the, the, the single dimensional version and, you know, as well. Because last time, remember, we have x out here. Um, and one thing to note here is that um, there's the prediction minus target. That's a residual. So the gradient is driven by um, you know, the, kind of this quantity. So if the prediction equals the target, uh, what's the gradient? It's going to be 0 which is kind of what you want. If you're already getting the answer correct, then you shouldn't want to move your, uh, your weights. right? So often, you know, we can do things in the abstract, and everything will work. But you know, it's, it's often a good idea to write down some 
objective functions, take the gradient, and see if gradient descent on using these gradients that you computed is kind of a sensible thing because there's kind of many layers you can understand and get intuition for this uh, stuff at the kind of the abstract level optimization or kind of at the algorithmic level. Like you pick up an example, is it sensible to update when the gradient uh, or then when the prediction equals the target? Okay, so so let's. Um, take the code that we from, have from last time, and I'm going to um, expand on it a little bit um, and hopefully set the stage for doing stochastic gradient. Um, okay, so, so last time we had gradient descent. Okay, so remember last time we defined a set of points. We defined the function, which is the train loss here. Um, we defined the, the derivative of the function, and then we had gradient descent, okay? Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of house cleaning. Um, just uh, um, don't mind me. Um, okay, so I'm going to make this a little bit more explicit what this algorithm is. Gradient descent depends on um, a function, a derivative of a function, and a, let's say um, you know the dimensionality. Um, and I can call this gradient with f df, and in this case it's uh, d where d equals 2. Okay, And I want to kind of uh, separate. This is the kind of algorithms, and this is you know, modeling. So this is what we want to compute, and this is you know, how we compute it. Okay, And this code should still work. OK. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is um, upgrade this to vectors. So I'll re remember, the x here is just a number. Right, but we want to support vectors. Um, so in Python, um, we're going to import numpy, so which is this uh, nice um, vector and matrix library. Um, and um, I'm going to make some you know, arrays here, um, which and this is just going to be a one-dimensional array, so it's not that exciting. Um, so this uh, this w dot x becomes uh, the actual dot I need to call, um, and I think, and w it needs to be mp dot zeros uh, d. Okay. All right. So that should st still run. Actually, sorry, this uh, this one dimensional. Okay. So remember last time we ran this uh, this program, and um, it starts out with some weights, and then it converges to point eight. And the function value kind of keeps on going down. Okay. All right. So let's let's try to um, you know it, it's really hard to kind of see whether this algorithm is any uh, doing anything interesting because we only have two points. It's kind of trivial. Um, so how do we go about um, you know because I'm going to also implement stochastic gradient and how do we have kind of a test case to see if this algorithm is you know working? Um, so there's kind of this technique which I, I really like, and it's you know which is to call you know generate artificial data, um, and the idea is that you know what is learning? You're learning as you're taking a data set and you're trying to fit uh, find the the weights that best fit that data set. Um, but in general, if I generate some arbitrary, if I download a data set, I have no idea what the right kind of quote unquote right answer is. So there's a technique where I go backwards. I say okay, let's let's decide what the right answer is. So let's say the right answer is um, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's a five-dimensional problem. Okay. Um, and I'm going to generate some data based on that so that this uh, weight vector is kind of good for that data. Oops. Um, I'm going to skip all my breaks in this lecture. Um, so I'm going to generate a bunch of points. So let's generate 10,000 points. The nice thing about artificial data is you can generate as much as you want. Um, there's a question. Yeah. A true W? Oh, so true W just means like the, the correct, the ground truth uh, W. Is this like a true Y, like the true output? Or? So W is a weight vector. So this is kind of going backwards. Remember, I want to fit the weight vector, but um, I'm just kind of saying this is the right answer. So I want to make sure that the algorithm actually recovers this later. 
OK, so I'm going to generate some random data. So there's a nice function, random.randn, um, which generates a random you know, d-dimensional vector. And y, I'm going to set, y, what should I set y to? Yeah, so, so I'm going to do regression. So I want to do uh, true w dot uh, x, right? So I mean, if you think about it, if I took this data and I found the, the, like true y, w is the right thing, that will get zero loss here, OK? But I'm going to make life a little bit more interesting. I'm going to add. Uh, um, some noise. Okay. Um, so let's print out what that looks like. Um, also, I should add it to my data set. Um, so Python gradient. Okay, so this is my data set. Okay, I mean, can't really tell what's going on, but um, but you can look at the code and you you can assure yourself that uh, this data has structure in it. OK, so let's get rid of this print statement. And let's train and see what happens. So um, let's, OK. Oh, one thing I forgot to do. Um, so if you notice that the objective functions that I've um, you know, written down, they have a divide by the number of data points. I want the average uh, loss, not the, the sum. Um, it turns out that you know, if you have the sum, then things get really big and you know, blow up. So let me just normalize that. OK, so let me not get rid of that. OK, so it's training. It's training. Um, actually, so let me pr uh, do more iterations. So I did 100 iterations. Let's do 1,000 iterations. OK? So you know, the function value is going down. That's always something to, you know, good to check. Um, and you can see the weights are kind of slowly getting to you know, what appears to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? OK? So you know, this is not hard proof, but it's kind of evidence that this uh, learning algorithm is actually kind of doing the right thing. Um, OK, so now let's see if uh, I add you know, more points. So I now have 100,000 points. Now it you know, obviously gets you know, slower. Um, and it'll you know, hopefully get there you know, one day, but I'm just going to kill it. OK, any questions about, uh, oops, my terminal got screwed up. OK, so what I do here, I define loss functions, took the derivatives. Um, the gradient descent is what we implemented last time. And the only thing different I did this time is generate a data set so I can kind of check whether gradient descent is working. Yeah, question. The gradient um, is just a residual as opposed to residual squared. Is that what enables the algorithm to learn like from over predictions versus like under predictions? Uh, the question is whether the fact that the gradient is residual allows the algorithm to learn from under or over predictions. Um, yeah, so the gradient is, if you think about it, yeah, that's good intuition. So if you look at, um, if you're over predicting, right? That means the gradient is kind of, assume that this is like 1. So that means this is going to be positive, which means that, hey, if you up that weight, you're going to over predict more and more and incur more loss. So um, by subtracting the gradient, you're kind of pushing the weights down in the other direction. And same for when you're um, you know, under predicting. Yeah, so that's good intuition to have. Yeah? What is the effect of the noise? Um, the effect of noise, it makes the problem a little bit you know, harder uh, so that it takes more s examples to learn. Um, if you shut off the noise, then it will, you know, we can try it. Um, I have never done this before, but presumably you'll learn you know, f faster, but maybe not. Um, the noise isn't you know, that much, but. Um, OK, so, so let's say I have you know, like 500 exam 1,000 examples. You know, that's quite a few examples. And now you know, this algorithm runs you know, pretty slowly. right? And in modern machine learning, you have you know, millions and hundreds of millions of examples. So grain descent is going to be you know, pretty slow. 
So how can we speed things up a little bit? And what's the problem here? Well, if you look at the, 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 what the algorithm is doing, it's iterating. And each iteration, it's computing the gradient of the training loss. And the training loss is um, just average of all the points, which means that you have to go through all the points, and you compute the gradient of the loss, and you add everything up. I mean, that's what is expensive and you know, takes time. So you, know, you might wonder, well, how, how can you avoid this? I mean, you, if you want to do gradient descent, you have to go through all your points. Um, and the, the key insight behind stochastic gradient descent is that, well, maybe, maybe you don't have to do that. So um, maybe, you know, here, here's some intuition, right? So what, what is this gradient? So this gradient is actually the sum of all the gradients from all the examples in your training set. Right? So we have 500,000 points adding to that. So actually, what this gradient is, is um, it's actually kind of a sum of different things, which are maybe pointing in slightly different directions, which all average out to this direction. Okay? So maybe you can actually not average all of them, but you can um, average just a couple. Or maybe even in an extreme case, you can just like take one of them and just you know, march in that direction. So, so here's the idea behind stochastic gradient descent. So instead of doing gradient descent, we're going to change the algorithm to say for each example in the training set, I'm just going to pick it up and just update. You know, it's, you know, Instead of like sitting down and going all over the, all the training examples and thinking really hard, I'm just going to pick up one training example and update right away. So again, the key idea here is it's not about quality, it's about uh, quantity. Maybe not the world's best life lesson, but it seems to work in, it works in here. Um, and then there's also this question of what should the step size be? And in general, in stochastic gradient descent, it's actually even a bit more important because um, when you're updating on each, each individual example, you're getting kind of noisy estimates of the actual gradient. And, uh, and people often ask me, like, oh, how should I set my step size? And, you know, and the answer is, like, there is no formula. Uh, I mean, there are formulas, but there's no kind of definitive answer. Here's some general guidance. Um, so if step size is small, so you're really close to zero, that means you're taking tiny steps, right? That means that uh, it'll take longer to get where you want to go. But you're kind of proceeding cautiously, so you, it's less likely you're going to you know, uh, if you mess up and go in the wrong direction, you're not going to go too far in the wrong direction. Um, conversely, if you have A to B really, really large, um, then you, you know, it's like a race car. You kind of drive really fast, but you might uh, just kind of bounce around a lot. Um, so pictorially, what kind of this looks like is that, you know, here's maybe a moderate step size, but if you're taking steps, um, really big steps, um, you know, you might go over here, and then you jump around, and then maybe, maybe you end up in the right place, but maybe sometimes you can actually get flung off out of orbit and uh, you know, diverge to infinity, which is a bad situation. Um, so, so there's many ways to set the step size. You can set it to a you know, constant. Um, you could usually have to um, you know, tune it. Um, or you can set it to be decreasing, the intuition being that as you optimize and get closer to the optimum, you kind of want to slow down, right? Like if you, you're coming on the freeway, you're driving really fast, but once you get to your house, you probably don't want to be like driving 60 miles an hour. OK. Um, so actually, I didn't implement stochastic gradient, so let me do that. So let's, let's try to get stochastic gradient up and going here. Um, OK, so, so the interface to stochastic gradient changes, So right? So the, in gradient descent, all you need is a function, and it, it just kind of computes the sum over all the training examples. Um, so in stochastic gradient, I'm going to just note SF for stochastic gradient. I'm going to take an index i, um, and I'm going to update on the ith point only. So I'm going to only compute the loss on the ith point. And same for the, its derivative. Um, I'm going to look at the ith point. Um, and just compute the gradient on that height point. Okay? Um, and this should be called SDF. 
OK, so now instead of doing gradient descent, let's do stochastic gradient descent. Um, and I'm going to pass in SD, SF, SDF, D, and um, the number of points, because I need to know how many points there are now. Um, copy gradient descent. And it's basically kind of the same function. I'm just going to stick another for loop in there. So stochastic gradient descent, it's going to take the stochastic function, the stochastic gradient, um, the dimensionality, and n. OK, so now before I was just going through um, number of iterations. And now, right, I'm not going to try to compute the value over the, all the training examples. I'm going to um, loop over all the points. And um, I'm going to call just evaluate the function at that point i. And compute the gradient at that point i instead of the entire you know, data set. Um, and then everything else is the same. I mean, one other thing I'll do here is that I'll s use a different step size schedule. So um, one divided by number of you know, updates. So I want it so that the number of, uh, of the step sizes kind of decrease over time. OK, so um, I start with 8 equals 1, and then it's half, and then it's a third, and it's a fourth, and it keeps on going down. Um, sometimes you can put a square root, and that's more typical in some cases. But um, I'm not going to worry about the details too much. Uh, question? The, the point i is chosen randomly, but here we just do it for every range. Yeah, yeah so the question is, um, the word stochastic means that there should be some randomness here. And you know, technically speaking, the, the stochastic gradient descent is where you're sampling a random point, and then you're updating on it. Uh, I'm cheating a little bit um, uh, because I'm iterating over all the points. You know, in practice, if you have a lot of points and you randomize the order, it's it kind of, you know, is, is similar. But it's uh, there is a kind of a technical difference that I'm trying to hide. Okay, so so this is stochastic gradient descent. Um, loop, iterate, you know, go over all the points and just you know update. Okay. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, okay. Um, I don't think that worked. <laughs> Maybe, hmm. Let's see what happened here. I did try it on 100,000 points. Maybe that works. Oh, nope, that didn't work either. Um, hmm. Anyone see the problem? Oh, so I'm printing this um, out uh, at the at the end um, of each iteration, so that should be fine. Um, really, this should work. So gradient descent was working, right? Maybe I'll uh, try. It's probably not the best idea to be debugging this uh, live, but okay. Let's let's make sure gradient descent works. Um, okay, so that was working, right? Okay, so stochastic gradient descent. I mean, it's really fast and converges, <laughs> but it doesn't converge to the right answer. Yeah, but that should get incremented to one. So um, that it might be true. OK, so I do have a version of this code that does work. <laughs> so what am I doing here that's different? OK, have some water. Maybe I need some water. OK. So this version works. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably good. That's a good call. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, now it works. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, yeah, this is a good uh, lesson. Um, is that when you're dividing, um, this needs to be one. Actually, in Python 3, this is not a problem, but I'm so on Python 2 for some reason. But this should be a 1.0 divided by num updates. Otherwise, I was getting. So how is it faster? OK, so why is it faster? Yeah. OK. OK. Let's, let's uh, go back to 500,000. OK. OK, so one full sweep over the data is the same amount of time. But you notice that immediately it already converges to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So this is like way, way faster than gradient descent. Remember? Uh, just to kind of compare, um, gradient descent is um, you run it. And after one step, it's like not even close, right? Yeah? What noise levels do you have to have until gradient descent becomes better? Um, so th it is true that if you have more noise, then gradient descent might be, uh, stochastic gradient descent can be unstable. Um, there might be ways to mitigate that with step size choices. But um, yeah, probably you have to add a lot of noise for stochastic gradient to be um, really bad. Um, I mean, this is in some sense, you know, if you take a step back and think about what's going on in this problem, <coughs> It's a five-dimensional problem. There's only five numbers. And I'm feeding it half a million data points, right? There, there aren't, there's not that much to learn here. And so there's a lot of redundancy in the data set. And generally, actually, this is true. Like in a large data set, there's going to be a lot of you know, redundancy. So going through all the data and then trying to make an informed decision is you know, pretty wasteful, where sometimes you can just kind of get a representative sample from. Um, one example, or more is common to do like kind of mini batches where you maybe grab a hundred examples and you update on that, which is so there's a way to be somewhere in between stochastic gradient and gradient descent. Okay, let me move on. Um, okay, summary so far we have linear predictors um, which are based on scores. So linear predictors include both classifiers and regressors. Um, we can do loss minimization. And we can, uh, if we implement it correctly, we can do uh, SGD. OK, so that was, I'm kind of switching things. I hope you're kind of following along. I introduced binary classification. And then I did all the optimization for linear regression. So now let's go back to classification and see if we could do stochastic gradient descent here. OK, so for classification, remember we decided that the 0 on loss is the thing we want, we want to minimize the number of mistakes. You know, who can argue with that? Um, so remember, what does zero one loss look like? It looks like this. Okay. So what happens if I try to run stochastic gradient descent on this? Um, I mean, I can run the code, <laughs> but yeah, it's it won't work, right? And why won't it work? Yeah, so th two popular answers are it's not differentiable. That's it's one problem. Um, but I think that the, the bigger problem, kind of the deeper problem, is that what is the, what is the gradient? Zero. zero. It's like zero basically everywhere except for this point, which uh, you know, doesn't really matter. So, um, so as, as we learned, that if you try to update with a gradient of zero, um, then you, you won't move your weights. right? So the gradient descent will not work on the zero on uh, loss. Um, so that's, that's kind of unfortunate. So how should we fix this problem? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's make the gradient not zero. Let's skew things. Um, so there's one loss, which I'm going to introduce, called the hinge loss, which uh, does exactly that. Um, so let me write the hinge loss down. And the hinge loss um, is basically uh, is 0 here when the margin is greater or equal to 1 and rises linearly. So if you've gotten it correct by a margin of 1, so you're kind of pretty safely on the side of I'm getting it correct, then we won't charge you anything. But as soon as you start you know, dipping into this area, we're going to charge you kind of a linear amount. And your loss is going to grow linearly. Um, so there's some reasons why this is a good idea. So it upper bounds the zero on loss. 
Um, it's, uh, it has a property called known as convexity, which means that if you actually run the gradient descent, you're actually going to converge to the global optimum. Um, I'm not going to get into that. And so that's, you know, that's a hinge loss. Um, so what remains to be done is to compute the gradient of this you know, hinge loss. Okay? So how do you compute this gradient? So in some sense, it's a trick question because the gradient doesn't exist because it's not um, you know, differentiable everywhere. But we're going to pr pretend that little point doesn't exist. Okay? So, so what is this hinge loss? The hinge loss is actually two functions, right? There's a zero function here, and then there is like this uh, one minus x function. Right? So what am I plotting here? I'm plotting the, the margin and uh, the loss, OK? So this is uh, the zero function, and this is uh, one minus uh, w dot phi of x, y. And the hinge loss is just the maximum of these two functions. So at every point, I'm just taking the top function. So um, that's how I'm able to trace out uh, this, this curve. Okay. All right, so if I want to take the gradient of this function, you, know, you, you can try to do the math, but let's think through it. You know, what, what should the gradient be? Um, well, if we're here, what should the gradient be? It's 0. And if I'm here, what should the gradient be? It should be the whatever the gradient of this function is, right? So in general, when you have a gradient of, a, of this kind of max, uh, you have to kind of break it up into cases, um, and depending on where you are, um, you you have a different case. So loss is equal to if I'm over here, and what's the condition for being over here? If the margin is greater than 1, right? And then otherwise, I'm going to take the gradient of this with respect to w, which is going to be minus v of x, y, you know, otherwise. Okay. Um, so again, we can try to interpret the, the gradient of the hinge loss. So remember, you're doing stochastic gradient descent. You have a wave vector, and you're going to pick up an example, and you say, oh, let's compute the gradient move away from it. So if you're getting an example right, then the gradient is 0. Don't move, which is the right thing to do. And otherwise, you're going to move in the direction, because you're minus minus, of phi of x, y, which kind of imprints this example into your wave vector. So, and you can formally show that it actually increases your uh, margin after you do this. Okay. Yeah. The margin one. What's the significance of the margin being one? Um, this is a little bit arbitrary. You're just kind of sending a non-zero value, um, and and you know in uh, support vector machines you set it to one, and then you have regularization on the weights, and that uh, gives you uh, some interpretation. So I don't have time to go over that right now, but uh, feel free to ask me later. There's another loss function. Uh, do you have a question? Yes. Why is the why do we choose the margin as the loss function as opposed to like the squared error or another? Yeah. So why do you choose the margin? So in classification, we're going to look at the margin because that tells you how confidently you're predicting, uh, you know, correctly. In regression, you're going to look at residuals and square losses. So it depends on kind of what problem you're trying to solve. Um, just really quickly, some of you might have heard of logistic regression. Logistic regression is this uh, yellow loss function. Right? So the point of this is saying that this loss minimization framework is you know, really general. And a lot of things that you might have heard of, least squares, logistic regression, are kind of special cases of this. So if you kind of master how to do loss minimization, you kind of uh, can do it all. OK, so summary. Um, basically, what's on the board here? If you're doing classification, you take the score, which comes from phi, uh, w dot phi of x, and you drive it into the sign, and then you get either plus one or minus one. Regression, you just use the score. Now, to train, you have to assess how well you're doing. In classification, there's the notion of a margin. Res uh, in regression, it's the residual. 
And then you can define loss functions. And here's, we only talked about five loss functions, but there's many others, um, especially for a kind of structure prediction or ranking problems. There's all sorts of different loss functions. But they're kind of based on these simple ideas of, you know, you have a hinge that upper bounds to 0, 1 if you're doing classification and um, some sort of square-like error for, you know, regression. And then once you have your loss functions, provided it's not 0, 1, you can optimize it using um, SGD, which turns out to be a lot faster than you know, gradient descent. OK, so next time we're going to talk about uh, phi of x, which we've kind of left as you know, someone just hands it to you. And then we're also going to talk about what is the really true objective of machine learning? Is it really to optimize the training loss? OK, so until next time. <laughs>